Hello. Today, I will be showing you how classical physics can yield quantum mechanics in very easy steps. To illustrate that quantum mechanics is just another branch of classical physics. This video is not to challenge quantum mechanics, but rather derive it from a rather different angle. We shall arrive at the same equations, but with more intuitively sensible details. If you wish to repudiate or refute this work, which I am sure you can't, or at least sensibly, please do so respectfully in the comments section. Imagine you are in deep space with nothing else in your nearest vicinity but two small objects, one substantially smaller than the other and orbiting the larger one in a circle. You have no idea of the nature of these objects. Keep your knowledge in physics, what will you say constitutes the centripetal force here? Is it just gravity, or just electromagnetism, or both? I think you will agree with me that the most plausible response is both. Therefore, you will write the centripetal force equal to the gravitational force plus the electrostatic force. Bring the common denominator together, you have this. We let the numerator be equal to sigma so that we have f equal sigma over r squared. From Newton's equation f equal ma, we have this. Therefore, v is given as follows. Angular momentum is given as mass times velocity times the radius. Subbing in the expression for v yields this. We can bring mr into the square root so that l simplifies to square root of m sigma r. If we multiply and divide by 2 pi, we have this. When you sub in the expression for sigma, you get the full form of the equation. This, this is where we cross into the world of new physics, quantum mechanics. Pay attention. If you found out somehow that the objects are neutral and hold no charge, then this term is equal to zero. And the equation reduces to this. But if you found out that their masses are very negligible, such that the charge dominates, then you can take GMM equal to zero and have this. However, the more realistic situation is that they will have both. Take the case where mass is negligible. A natural example is the hydrogen atom. Therefore, capital Q equal to little q, which is equal to the electronic charge E. R will be the ball radius, and M the mass of the electron. Put those values into the equation, and you will be amazed at the result. You get L equal to the value of the reduced Planck's constant h bar which means the Planck's constant h is equal to this square root. To get an even better value for h, include the term gmm since it is not zero. So for hydrogen, we can write L equal to h over 2 pi, the Bohr formula. Isn't this amazing how you can get the fundamental quantum mechanical equation from pure classical analysis? If you let r equal to n squared r naught, we get the more general equation l equal to nh on 2 pi. The same argument can be made if mass dominated instead, in which case h will be this. Since this particle is performing circular motion, it has wavelength, which is the distance it covers when it makes one revolution and that is equal to 2 pi r. It also has linear momentum given by mv. Multiply these two equations together, you get this. Notice that mvr is equal to angular momentum, so lambda dot p is equal to 2 pi l. For hydrogen, l is equal to h on 2 pi. So lambda dot p becomes 2 pi times h on 2 pi. 
the two pies cancel and we are left with just h. Therefore, wavelength is equal to Planck's constant over momentum, the de Broglie formula, another quantum mechanical equation derived from classical physics. This approach reveals a very powerful hidden fact. Do you notice that this form of the de Broglie equation is only valid for hydrogen? The more general form of L is NH on 2 pi, which means that lambda dot P is equal to NNH, hence lambda equal to NH over P. The presence of N in this equation is a very powerful detail that was missed by de Broglie. You will see later how drastically it changed the solutions to the Schrodinger equation shortly. It tells you also that linear momentum is quantized. The velocity of this particle is equal to the circumference over the period, that is, lambda on t. Since 1 over t is equal to frequency, then v is equal to lambda f or lambda equal to v on f. Sub this into our de Broglie equation for hydrogen, you have this which can be rearranged as follows. Let me digress. You can use the Bohr equation and the equation f equal ma to show that r and v are given as follows. If you have done a bit of atomic physics, you should be able to concede this immediately. pv is equal to mv dot v, which is equal to mv squared. Stop in the expression for V and you have this. Also, potential energy is defined as follows. Sub in the expression for R and you get this, the same expression as that of PV. So it is clear that PV is the potential energy of the particle, something which is generally misconstrued as the total energy of the particle. Back to our expression, PV equal HF. This becomes E equal HF, the Planck-Einstein equation. Please bear in mind that E is a potential energy, not the total energy, and the equation is for hydrogen. To get a general equation, we have to use the general de Broglie equation, NH on P, in which case we get E equal to NHF the correct form of Planck's quantization equation. The presence of N here is again a very important detail. This is another important quantum mechanical formula gotten directly from classical analysis. Having the de Broglie equation and the Planck-Einstein equation, we can derive the Schrodinger equation. Total mechanical energy is given as the kinetic energy plus the potential energy which can be written in terms of linear momentum as follows. You can use this and this to have p squared over 2m equal to this. Likewise, you can use this and this to get e equal to, to get e equal to nh bar omega. And note that this is the potential energy. So, our equation becomes this. I can send the kinetic energy term to the other side to have this, with a negative sign. Applying a wave function psi and doing a little calculus, you get the Schrodinger equation as this. The Schrodinger equation you know looks like this. Let me point out the key differences. Firstly, the presence of the n terms in the equation. Secondly, the absence of the negative sign on the kinetic energy term. And thirdly, the positions of the potential total energy terms have been swapped. I could still derive the normal Schrodinger equation. All I have to do is use the de Broglie and Planck equations that work only for hydrogen, and also assume that E equal HF is total energy, not potential energy. This will mean that the Schrodinger equation gotten will work only for hydrogen, which appears to be the case. 
Let me show you the power that the presence of n in the equation has. It will totally transform the interpretation of quantum mechanics. Let's solve the Schrodinger equation for the particle in a box problem. I have solved this problem with and without swapping the positions of the potential and total energy terms and had exactly the same result. We first have to split the wave function into two other functions, one completely dependent on time and the other completely dependent on space. Swapping that into the Schrodinger equation yields the following expressions, where c is the common constant. For the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, get phi of t equal to this. For the exponents to be unitless, c over n h bar must have units of frequency. Therefore, omega equal to c on n h bar or c equal to n h bar omega which is the potential energy. So the common factor is the potential energy. Let's put that into the time-independent Schrodinger equation. For the particle in the box problem, the potential outside is infinite, while the potential inside is zero. So inside the box, the equation reduces to this. Let's bring all the constants to one side. We can now let alpha to be equal to this, just to reduce the bulkiness of the equation. Now the solution to this equation is as follows. Since the wave function is zero outside the box, it should also be zero at the boundaries. So rho of zero is equal to rho of a, which is equal to zero. If rho of zero is zero, then b is equal to zero in which case rho of a is this and is equal to zero. This equation is true only if the sign of this is equal to zero. So the general solution is square root of alpha a equal to n pi. The appearance of this n here is what introduces quantization of energy in quantum mechanics. But let me blow your mind. Let us rearrange the equation like so. When we sub in the expression for alpha, we get this. Now notice the presence of the n we had introduced in our Schrodinger equation, which can now cancel with this one. Therefore, we have total energy equal to this, made of constants and hence constant. Without the presence of the n term we introduced earlier, this equation for energy will be like this, with the n addition which makes the total energy non-definitive and is generally interpreted as the electron being in all energy levels at the same time, a violation of the second law of thermodynamics. Since no such thing arises from my solution, then this is where the discussion of quantum mechanics ends. It cannot go further. Does this approach not make more sense? If you agree, please like the video and consider subscribing. Thanks for watching.